Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. This is lesson number 10 in that series for September 2 of 2023. And it's entitled Husbands and Wives. I wonder who those people are. Together at the Cross. That's an interesting subject. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we ask your special presence with us as we discuss this uh, very interesting and challenging subject. How many of us need guidance in dealing with spouses and knowing how we best can make how we can make the best of our marriages? May this help us as we work through as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians 4 through 6, Paul talks about the practical aspects of our understanding of Christianity. Now, he's talked about the basic fundamentals and things in, in verse chapters 1 through 3. And now he said, okay, it's time for us to put the, put the metal to the road, right? Um, this particular lesson will focus on Ephesians 5, 21 to 33 considering how Christ relates to us as individuals, particularly in our marriage relationships. Jim? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 23. Submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. <clears throat> Wives, submit yourselves to... As, excuse me. Submit your... Excuse me. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband has authority over his wife just as Christ has authority over the church, and Christ is himself the savior of the church, his body. So wives must submit completely to their husbands, just as the church submits itself to Christ. So we should just stop right there. That's the whole story said, right? So That's this, what the men say. <laughs> so does the church submit to Christ? Well, Which part of okay, the there's, there's more to the story. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making a clean wash, excuse me, after making it clean by washing it in water in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other imperfection. Men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. People never hate their own bodies. Instead, they feed them and take care of them, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. As the scripture says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. There is a deep secret be truth be revealed in this scripture, which I understand as applying to Christ and the church. But it also applies to you. Every husband must love his wife and as himself, and every wife must respect her husband. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. I'm now working part-time with a research project to help people lose weight. So I can assure you that people don't have any problem feeding themselves. <laughs> Okay, Carrie, you want to take on the next one there? This council of Bible students today may hear the risen Christ addressing our relationships. We are positioned to do so when we understand. Uh, Ephesians 5.21 through 6.9 As Paul's way of actualizing the great theme of the letter, unity, but now for the Christian household. While he offers a strong critique of the flawed social structures of the old humanity, see Ephesians 4.22, he also celebrates the creation of a new humanity, see Ephesians 2.15, embedded within the wider humanity with its flawed social structures. Now let me interrupt there for just a second. So Paul is saying, we have gathered together people from a whole variety of situations and we pulled them together 
and we pull them together to form a new kind of humanity that lives together in peace and harmony. And this is a church. This is a church, and this is the way the church is supposed to function. Okay? From within these structures, believers demonstrate that a new power, the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2, 22, Ephesians 3, 16 through Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, Ephesians 6, 17, 18, and a new ethnic patent on Christ, Ephesians 4, 13, 15, 20 to 24, 32, Ephesians 5, 2, 10, 17, 21 to 33, have been unleashed, which points toward the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan for his people and the world. So Paul is saying, I've explained something about the whole plan of salvation in chapters 1 through 3, pretty briefly, but some pretty potent stuff there. And now let's see how that's going to apply to the way people actually live their lives on a day-by-day -day basis. So in these verses, <clears throat> Paul was drawing, drawing a strong contrast between the way marriages were typically regarded in his society and the way Christians should treat their spouses. Okay. Paul started this discussion by mentioning something quite interesting. Now I'm going to go back and read Ephesians 5.21 with some additions. Addressed to church members, submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Oh, to church members. The New Testament talks about church members in passages like Mark 10, Romans 12, and Philippians 2. It is clear that we are to love one another warmly as Christians, brothers and sisters, and to be eager to show respect for one another. Ephesians 5.21 is not just a passage about how husbands and wives are to relate to each other, although it does talk about that, but it also talks about how we should relate to all other true church members. That's what Paul, well, ultimately that's what's going to happen in heaven, right? So how are we to understand that? In the very next verse, Ephesians 5.22, it says, Jennifer, I think that's Ephesians you. Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. From the Good News Bible. Okay. 1 Peter 3.15, In the same way, you wives must submit to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe God's word, your conduct will win them over to believe. It will not be necessary for you to say a word. For the devout women of the past who placed their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful by submitting to their husbands. From the Good News Bible. Okay. So how do devout women make themselves beautiful? They make themselves beautiful by living beautiful Christian lives. In fact, they should honor Christ even before they honor their husbands. Ooh. Wow. Gordon? In the Bible study guide. In both Colossians and Ephesians, Christ, and only Christ, is identified as the head of the church, which is his body. Several references are given. Christ is the head of the church, and he is a savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. By analogy, the husband is the head of the wife, with the church's faithfulness to Christ serving as a model for the wife's loyalty to her husband. Myra, did you hear oh, that? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, the church's faithfulness to Christ. How faithful is the church to Christ? Not very, huh? What kind of a model is that? Wow. Okay, go ahead. The passage presumes a loving, caring marriage and not a dysfunctional one. This verse should not be interpreted to allow any form of domestic abuse. That's for sure. So now, let's be honest with this passage. Which worries you the most? One, the church's unfaithfulness to Christ, or two, wives' unfaithfulness to their husbands. Was the church in Paul's day faithful to Christ? Well, look at this, just to give us an idea. We've, we've been reading a lot of things that sound pretty scary. Look at... Look at um, Revelation 2, the first four verses. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, now this was, this was 30 years after Paul, okay? This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and two, who walks among the seven gold lampstands. 
I know what you have done. I know how hard you have worked. No, this is, I know what you've done. I know how hard you've worked. That's the, those, are, those are praiseworthy, right? And how patient you have been. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested those who say they're apostles but are not and have found out that they are liars. You are patient, but you have, you have suffered for my sake and you have not given up. But this is what I have against you. You do not love me now as you did at first. Oh, too bad. Think of how far you have fallen. And we don't need to go on. I think you're all pretty much familiar with the rest of that story. But at least it sounds like back in the beginning, what? They were doing a pretty good job, weren't they? Okay, Ellen White. So that Las Vegas church was doing pretty good, huh? Sounds like it. No, LNG uh, you know, I, I, I need to clarify that. The people who knew about or lived nearby the Las Vegas church were doing pretty well. It wasn't the, it wasn't the Las Vegas church. Unless you met that, by that you met the Christians. Christians who, in Las Vegas. Okay, the Christians in Las Vegas. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Ellen G. White says, If he, the husband, is a coarse, rough, boisterous, egotistical, harsh, and overbearing man. Let him never utter a word that the husband is the head of his wife, is, is the head of the wife, and that she must submit to him in everything. For he is not the Lord. He is not the husband in the true significance of the term. Okay. Well, thank so you she for went, you read that one. Huh? Thank you for letting you read that one. Yeah. Oh, we've got some good ones coming up. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 28, 25 to 29 shows some similarity to a very interesting passage in Ezekiel. I'll go ahead and read Ephesians 5, 25 to 29. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Now, there's a challenge. Nobody can argue about that challenge. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word, after making it clean by washing it in water, in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other imperfection. So just to back up for a second, what do you suppose is implied when it talks about making it clean by washing it in water? Baptism. Probably baptism, yeah, almost certainly. Men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. People never hate their own bodies. Instead, they feed them and take care of them just as Christ does the church. Well, it looks like Paul is getting some ideas from the Old Testament. Jim, would you like to read some very interesting words from the Old Testament for us? The, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verses 1 to 14. The Lord spoke to me again. Mortal man, he said, point out to Jerusalem what disgusting things she has done. Tell Jerusalem what the sovereign Lord is saying to her. You were born in the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite. Your mother was a Hittite. When is that praise or what is that? Well, he's just a little genealogy there. <laughs> <laughs> genealogy of those that were supposed to have been killed and driven out. Yes. Okay. When you were born, no one cut your umbilical cord or washed your, or rubbed you with salt or wrapped you in cloth. No one looked upon, excuse me, no one took enough pity on you to do any of these things for you. When you were born, no one loved you. You were thrown out in an open field. Then wow. I passed by and saw you squirming in your own blood. You were covered with blood, but I couldn't let you die. I made you grow like a healthy plant. You grew strong and tall and became a young woman. Your breasts were well formed and your hair had grown, but you were naked. As I passed by again, I saw that the time had come for you to fall in love. I covered your naked body with my coat and promised to you love to you. Yes, I made a marriage covenant with you and you became mine. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Then okay, I took- now I'm gonna interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> When Ezekiel, many, many, many times, and Jeremiah too, many times in his uh, book, uses that expression, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, is he directly quoting something that God gave him? 
Sounds like it. It's attributed to him anyway. That Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow, okay. Okay, uh, verse 9. Then I took water and washed you the blood off of you. I rubbed your, excuse me, I rubbed olive oil on your skin. I dressed you in embroidered gowns and you, excuse me, and gave you shoes of the best leather, a linen headband, and a silk cloak. I put jewels on you, oh, bracelets yeah. and necklaces. Uh oh. Well, there's the problem. <laughs> Hang on, it's not. It's going to get worse. Go ahead. I put jewels on you, bracelets and necklaces. I gave you a nose ring and earrings and a beautiful crown to wear. You had ornaments of gold and silver, and you were always wore clothes of embroidered linen and silk. You ate bread made from the best flour and had honey and olive oil to eat. Your beauty was dazzling, and you became a queen. You became famous in every nation for your perfect beauty because I was the one who made you so lovely. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Also from the Good News Bible. Okay. Is this the kind of... Well, this is the kind of lady that God wants to marry? Or did God... Minus the bracelets and earrings and nose ring and... Something. No, it didn't say that. Didn't say I, I, that. I'm editorializing. <laughs> you're put. You're reading. You're, you're, what are you, that's called eisegesis. Is yes, what you're I doing. Know. Okay. We want to try to do exegesis. Unfortunately, if we have the wrong presupposition, we're going to end up with eisegesis. Yeah. Did God <laughs> really tell Ezekiel to represent his relationship to his people on this earth in these <clears> words? <throat> Think about what is implied by these passages in Ephesians and in Ezekiel. How does Christ treat his bride, the church? As noted in the Bible study guide, he... Whose turn is it now? Loves the church as a bride, Ephesians 5, 25. We must never forget that this is hard work for Jesus. He loves us. Two, gives himself as the bride price. In the context of angel, angel rather ancient, wedding arrangements, the bridegroom would purchase the bride with the bride price, which was usually a large sum of money and valuables, so large that ancient village economies depended upon the custom. Christ pays the ultimate price for the church as his bride since he gave himself for her. That's Ephesians 5.25 in KJV. In the incarnation and at the cross, he gives himself as the bride price. Three, bathes his bride. The mm. preparation of the bride was an important part of the ancient wedding festivities. As is also true today, it was the bridesmaids and female relatives of the bride who prepared her for the ceremony. Paul, though, imagines the divine bridegroom preparing his bride for the wedding. It is he who sanctifies and cleanses her by the washing of water, <coughs> Ephesians 5.26, a probable reference to baptism. And then we come to section four, speak the word of promise. This cleansing is performed with the word, Ephesians 5.26, pointing to the word of promise that the divine bridegroom speaks to his bride, perhaps in the context of the betrothal ceremony. Compared okay, so, okay, think about this for a moment. What happens in a betrothal ceremony? The two parties become one. Well, they, they promise at least to do that, don't they? This is a contract between husbands and wives. And here we're talking about a contract between Jesus and Church. us. Yeah. Okay? So it's this? noting God's promises to believers at the time of their conversion. Okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Betrothal was the ancient version of modern engagement, but was a much more serious set of negotiations which included a written agreement about the bride price and in brackets from the husband and the dowry and in brackets asserts 
the assets. Assets, yes. The, the bride would bring to the marriage from her family. I have to tell you a funny little story. Um, we used to live in Africa for many years, and one of the tribes there, it was typical for someone to give up to 12 cows as a bride price. The husband would pay that to the bride's family to, for the bride. And so one time my daughter, when she came back to here in the U.S., was working at a summer camp, and there was a young man there that uh, thought she was kind of nice. And so he, she somehow or other, the story got out that in order to ask, in order to marry someone, you had to give a pride rice with 12 cows. And so he showed up with 12 little plastic cows. <laughs> <laughs> give them to you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Jennifer, you can pick it up there. Five, prepares and adorns the bride. <laughs> When the bride is finally presented to her groom, she is fabulously beautiful, appearing in flawless splendor, from Ephesians 5.27. Christ not only bathes the bride, he prepares and adorns her as well. Okay, that's from our collection from our Bible study guide. So let's just review those points again very quickly. Christ loves the church as bride. He gives himself as the bride price. He, in other words, he paid for her. He bathes his bride. He's preparing her in every possible way to make her as beautiful as possible. He speaks the word of promise. That's the betrothal. Uh, then he prepares and adorns the bride. So Christ does everything to prepare. Who is he preparing? Us. Us. He's making everything. He's doing everything he possibly can to prepare us for an eternal wedding eternal life together. So do these words portray to you Christ's love for us as individuals? Why does God consider us as being so valuable? How do these words apply to Christ's love for the church? Let's see if we can dig a little deeper here. The Gordon? Bible study guide for Tuesday, betrothal. Christ offered himself up for the church as bride price and so became betrothed to her. Number two, preparation for the wedding ceremony. The attentions of the bridegroom continue in his present efforts to sanctify and cleanse the bride. Three, the wedding ceremony itself. Christ's pres uh, present attentions are in view of the presentation of the bride at the wedding. This last element looks to the grand wedding celebration at his return when Christ, the bridegroom, will come to claim the church as bride and present her to himself. Several wow. references from the Bible study guide. Okay, so Paul talks a little bit about that in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 4. Myra? I wish you would tolerate me even when I am a bit foolish. Please do. I am jealous for you. Just as God is, you are like a pure virgin whom I have promised in marriage to one man only, Christ himself. Now, I'm going to interrupt for a little bit. Paul is speaking to these people that have come out of this incredible background, Ephesus and probably some of the other cities around which were just about as bad, and they have come out and they have stood firm for the truth and for the Christianity and so forth. So Paul is saying... Look at you. You're a pure, pure virgin, which God has promised to himself. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, am afraid. I am afraid that your minds will be corrupted and that you will abandon your full and pure devotion to Christ in the same way that Eve was deceived by the snake's clever lies. For you gladly tolerate anyone who comes up to you and preaches a different Jesus. Not the one we preached, and you accept the spirit and the gospel completely, different from the spirit and gospel you received from us. I'm going to interrupt for a second there and take you to another passage just to give you a little idea of what, what was going on there. Uh, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 1. Let's see if I've got that entered correctly. Starting with verse 8. 
from Paul who's called, I'm sorry, up down here to verse 8. But even if we or an angel, this is Paul writing, but even if, again, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preach to you, may he be condemned to hell. Did he feel strongly about this? We have said it before and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Is that strong enough language? Some places it says anathema. Yeah, well, that, the Greek word is anathema. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, anathema, is a word, anathema is a word which means cease to exist. So, is that the same as being condemned to hell? Well, if, they, if they're well, existing in hell, because that's the traditional teaching about yeah. <laughs> that you don't really die. Paul had a lot of trouble with people traveling behind him, trying to present a different gospel. Hence, from other parts of Paul's letters, he suggested that this, quote, <clears throat> different gospel was being preached by Pharisees and other Jews. Remember, Paul used to be what? A Pharisee. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. And now the Pharisees are following around, the other, including other Jews who, were fo who followed Paul and insisted that in order to be a real Christian, one first must become a fully recognized Jew, including circumcision and a full list of ceremony requirements. And if you want to understand the full extent of that argument, you need to read Acts 15 and then read uh, Romans uh, 14 and then read 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. And you'll see this was, this was a thing that almost tore the church apart. I mean, it was a big deal. Paul suggested that because of the life and death of Jesus and the meaning it had come to have for church members, they should be drawn to Christ with an indissoluble bond. At one time, those church members had been far away from God, but after listening to Paul and other Christian leaders, they had grown to be faithful church members. And the implication is even in Ephesus, even in Ephesus. Okay, Colossians 1, 21 and 22. At one time you were far away from God and were his enemies because of the evil things you did and thought. By the way, Colossians is not very far from Ephesus uh, if you ever go there. But now by means of the physical death of his son, God has made you his friends in order to bring you holy, pure, and faultless into his presence. From our Bible study guide we read, Ancient weddings often began with a nighttime parade. Think about Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the ten virgins. The groom and his entourage would gather at the groom's home, the couple's new home, which would be the couple's new home, and with grand ceremony begin a procession, lit by torches and accompanied by joyful lilting music and great rejoicing, the crowd jostles toward the home of the father of the bride. Gathering up the bride there and meeting, or meeting the bride's own procession on the way, the parade would convey the couple to their new home where the guests would settle into a week-long feast culminating in the wedding ceremony when the bride would be presented to the groom. Wow. That was quite, a, quite an occasion. Think these, over... These were arranged marriages back then too, yes. right? So mm -hmm. the bride may never have seen the groom before and vice versa. Possible. Think over what you know about the history of the Christian church from Paul's day to ours. How long has God been waiting for us to accept his invitation and to get ourselves ready? There's a section in the book of Evangelism by Ellen White, pages 694 to 697, which you should read and weep. She says there that we're already long delay and the year was 1868. And then later in 1883, she said, we should, we should have been in the kingdom long before now. And she goes on and on and on and on. Anyway, when you think about the second coming, what mental picture comes up? When Jesus shows up with the entire sky being full of bright, shining angels, <clears throat> will you be excited or scared? Could you be some of both? Paul had a very different idea about how Christian wives and husbands should relate to each other than did the rest of society in those days. 
he challenged Christian husbands to turn from the expected practices of their time and to seek to match Christ's tender love. So we could go back and read Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 again. We won't do that right now in light of the passage of our time. Then Paul added another metaphor to his story. He dove even deeper into his explanations of how husbands and wives should get along in these words, Ephesians 5, 28 to 30. Jim, that would be yours. Men ought to love their wives just as, love, as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. People never hate their own bodies. Instead, they feel themselves, excuse me, they feed them and take care of them just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Good News Bible. Okay, go ahead and read the next From one. From the now. Bible study guide, Paul says, we have Paul's rules for the Christian household. Disclose a challenging societal context. In Ephesians 5, 28 to 30, Paul addresses husbands who, following the all-too-frequent pattern of the time, may choose to hate your own flesh. Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. Abusing and beating your wives in the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, the legal power of the father of the family, Latin pater familias, was very broad. He could punish harshly or even kill his wife, children, and slaves, and be within his legal rights of, though exercising his power in extreme ways, was increasingly constrained by public opinion. Thank goodness. In Ephesians 5, 28 to 30, Paul adds a new rationale to support the love of Christians' husbands for their wives. Self-love. Paul so offers it. He's saying here, let's just spell this out. He's saying a true husband loves his wife just as much as he loves himself. So he's calling that self-love. That's not selfishness in this case. Go ahead. Paul offers a truism. No one ever hated his own flesh, <coughs> at least no one thinking clearly. Husbands don't harm themselves or beat up on their own bodies. Instead, they nourish and cherish them, Ephesians 5.29 from the New King James Version. In a bid to eliminate harshness and violence, against Christian wives, Paul invites the Christian husband to identify with his wife. You are so much one, you are so much one with your wife. Paul argues that in harm, excuse me, that to harm her is nothing short of inflicting harm and most people do their- Inflicting self-harm. That's correct. Inflicting self-harm and most people in their right minds don't do that from the Bible study guide. You, you, years ago, you used to, or every else, you mentioned a story how in Africa, how a certain uh, wife may say, doesn't your, doesn't your wife or husband yeah, oh, love yeah. you? Yeah, they, <clears throat> we had, the first place we worked in Africa was a big, big hospital, and for a while, I was the only doctor there. And we would come to church with our kids and so forth, and we were always nice to each other, amazing. And the Africans just came to us, he says, how do you get to your wife to obey you without beating her? <laughs> How do they know you don't beat her? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask that question. Well, what would happen to our marriages if each spouse modeled his relationship to his or her partner according to what she or he knows about the life and practices of Jesus Christ? Well, then Paul picked another metaphor, a very early one found in Genesis 2. Let's look at that, if, uh, Carrie. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. So he took some soil from the ground and formed all the animals and all the birds. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And so that's, that's, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt there for a second. That's a very important point that we sometimes don't recognize. God gave Adam the skills, the scientific knowledge or whatever to name all the animals right there before Eve was even created. And it's probably not just saying you're a lion and you're no. a giraffe, but uh, he, he, seeing they, the similarities and the differences yep. and describing them. Exactly. Okay, go ahead. I was listening, I lost this place. I was thinking, to some, the, uh, 
I've never seemed to mention here, not necessarily just this little bit, um, I've seen husbands do some pretty bad stuff to their wives. Yes. And one of them was my own father, and I've never forgotten it. In fact, I told him if he did that again, I would get him out. And uh, there's stuff there that they miss. They don't get it. Mm -hmm. uh, where were we? Then he brought Verse them. Verse 20. Yeah, good. Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And that is how they all got their names. So the man named all the birds and all the animals. But not one of them was a suitable companion to help him. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep, <coughs> and while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. I have to interrupt again for just a moment. My father was an anesthesiologist, and he said one of the very first things that the good Lord did was he was an anesthesiologist. <laughs> Before he was a surgeon. Before he was a surgeon. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, he formed a woman. Where was this? Okay. He formed a woman out of the river and brought her to him. And the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind. Bone taken from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one. The man and the woman were both naked, but they were not embarrassed. I, I sometimes have thought, okay, Adam wakes up and he's sort of blinking his eyes a little bit, and there is something he, like he's never seen before. I mean, what kind of response do you suppose that was? It must have been amazing. Okay. Some men claim that men are superior to women and that women should obey them because the first woman was taken out of a man. And that's the story we just read, the story of Adam. They seem to forget that every man since that day has been taken out of a woman. <laughs> Paul, but we need to remember that point. Paul pointed out that marriage is intended to be a one flesh experience. From our Bible study guide, Jennifer. Note that in choosing Genesis 2.24, Paul selects a statement about marriage made before the fall and applies it to the relationships between Christian husbands and wives. In our distinctly post-fall world, rampant exploitation of the sexual relationship between a man and a woman reveals how deeply entrenched in modern cultures is the idea that the sexual union represents subjugation of the woman. Paul argues that the sexual relationship as reflected in Genesis, is not one of subjugation, but of union. It does not symbolize or actualize the dominance of the male, but the union of husband and wife, so much so that they are, quote, one flesh, end quote. We may look to both Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, and Genesis 2, 24, then, for an important countercultural and corrective theology of marriage and sexuality in the adult study Bible. Okay, very good. So Paul concluded by saying that just as Christ loves the church, husbands should love their wives. As a double metaphor, husbands should love their wives and wives should love their husbands just as Christ loves the church. I mean, he's, he, what's he saying here? He's saying husbands and wives should learn from Christ and Christ illustrates, hopefully illustrates for the church what husbands and wives do. Um, is that an example that is even possible to reach? Unfortunately, there is a very natural tendency for marriage partners to try to coerce or control their partners. Ellen G. White consistently urged marriage partners to turn away from efforts to control the other. Gordon? From Ministry of Healing, do not try to compel each other to yield to your wishes, Myra. You cannot do this <laughs> and retain each other's love. Be kind, patient, and forbearing, considerate, and courteous mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to each other. And uh, from the Bible study guide, she comments, as quoted in Adventist Home, directly on the interpretation and application of Colossians 3.18 and Ephesians 5.22-24. And then Ellen White quoting from 
Adventist home. The question is often asked, shall a wife have no will of her own? The Bible plainly states that the husband is the head of the family. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. If this injunction ended here, we might say that the position of the wife is not an enviable one. Many husbands stop at the words, wives, submit yourselves. But we will read the conclusion of the same injunction, which is, as it is fit in the Lord, Colossians 3.18. God requires that the wife shall keep the fear and glory of God ever before her. Entire submission is to be made only to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has purchased her as his own child by the infinite price of his life. There is one who stands higher than the husband to the wife. It is her Redeemer, and her submission to her husband is to be rendered as God has directed, quote, as it is fit in the Lord, end quote, written in 1891. That would be from Australia. Are these words from Paul and Ellen White sufficiently clear to us to understand the highest standard to which Christ is calling us? Unfortunately, there are many in our world who believe that Christian standards are outdated and outmoded. And you see, you, I can't believe how, how things are going in the, in the news these days. Someone even talks about how we should do things in a Christian way. Ah, that's how, that's how, I mean, I, I just, I, every time that sort of happens, I blink my eyes a couple of times. And, whoa. How would you try to enlighten such a person by presenting the truth from these texts, especially Ephesians 5, 21 to 23? Well, it's becoming more and more clear that Paul had a central message in Ephesians. Now, let's see if we can grab some of that central message and bring it to our subject for this time. From the Bible study guide, it says, Unity runs like a golden thread through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Unity applies not only to the relation between the Jews and the Gentiles in the church in Ephesians 2. <clears throat> Throughout the epistle, Paul discusses how unity is brought about by the triune God, by salvation, by baptism, by faith, by spiritual gifts, by the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, by the transformation of our walk of life, according to the pattern of Christ and by Christian wisdom. Ultimately, for Paul, unity, unity in all its aspects is possible only in Christ. Paul brings to the outright play, rightful place his entire discussion of the unity of the church as the one humanity. The new humanity. The, I'm sorry, the new humanity, the family. <clears throat> If ever there was an example or a model of unity, it is the family. Okay, let's think about this for just a moment. Paul is saying here that he's talking about a church that needs to come together. And these people should treat each other the same way that a perfect family treats each other. Isn't that what, isn't that what we're saying here? He's saying the church should be, we should care for each other, we should love each other, we should help each other, etc. That's what a family, the perfect family does, and that's the way church members should relate to each other. I mean, in, in the larger scale, right? That's at one moment. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something the Creator has worked at for the, all of His creation for since yeah. Since creation. Since, since, uh, in, since inception and created any intelligent creatures. Since at one moment, at one moment fell apart in heaven. Well, he's, it was, since, uh, the rebellion started, basically. Well, it was even before the rebellion because everything he was doing was an attempt to, to uh, have a, a harmony well, at one moment in, in his, all of his creation. He and already. He, but love with freedom. You ha in order to have love, you have to have freedom. Yeah. And with freedom, you have the, uh, the capacity to choose not to love yeah. and choose to live out of harmony. <clears throat> and there's consequences. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what happened. Well, as elsewhere in his business, Paul mixes a solid theological discussion, the doctrine of Christ, what we believe about Christ <clears throat> and how he relates to our salvation, 
and the doctrines of the church and his practical considerations. In Paul's view, biblical theology does not exist for the sole purpose of devising a coherent and beautiful intellectual system. The apostles' practical message is always built on the solid foundation of biblical theology. So what, is, what, what are we trying to say here? We're trying to say the theology, I mean, if it's just, for, if it's just a subject to discuss because we like to spend our time discussing, uh, that doesn't do the job. In Paul's mind, this theology is to be lived out. And it's supposed to be lived out in the marriage. It's supposed to li be lived out in the church. For this reason, the apostle does not approach the discussion of the family as if it were a marginal topic that could be addressed with a few solutions taken from general human wisdom, psychology, or sociology. Rather, he places his discussion of the family in the context of foundational Christian doctrines, God, creation, Christ, salvation, and the church. I mean, the family is right in the middle of all of that. In fact, here Paul does not use the family to illustrate these doctrines, but rather uses these doctrines to illustrate the Christian family. And it should, of course, should be both ways. The perfect family would be an illustration of how all these other things should be. But all these other things also illustrate how the family should be. As in the case of the church, Paul does not accept the approach for the Christian family be does not accept that the approach to the Christian family be determined by realities of our fallen human nature and society. Rather, he follows Jesus's, Jesus, quote, to the beginning, interpretive principle, but from the beginning it was not so. And some of us who remember studying with Graham Maxwell, very often that would be his question. But from the beginning it was not so. Which helps the Christian church and its theology to orient itself toward the restoration of God's ideals for us, as opposed to legitimizing the realities of the sinful world. And of course, some Christians, you probably heard them make the statement, in the beginning it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> well, um, Paul's treatment of the family in the context of these foundational Christian doctrines shows that the Christian family cannot be subjected to compromise from our Bible study guide. No doubt each one of us has heard some fairly lengthy discussions about how husbands and wives should relate to each other based on this passage of Scripture in Ephesians 5. Let's pull together several main points. Where are we here? Gordon, I think that's you. Several points may help us gain a better understanding of the passage. Number one, the attitudes of both the husband and wife come from the context of submitting to one another as a result of being filled by the Holy Spirit and references are given. Number two, the wife submits to her husband not as to a boss but as to Christ, her Savior and protector. The meaning of submission is to hold her husband in high regard, respecting, acknowledging, and appreciating him as her protector and helper. The Bible does not provide any foundation to the notion of regarding the wife as inferior to her husband and therefore in subjection to him as a superior. In spite of the fact that Myra thinks I'm superior. No, keep, you don't? Okay. No. Let's keep it. Keep, Three. Keep going. <laughs> Husbands, in their turn, must remember that women perceive love in terms of care and protection. The husband's love for his wife is like the Lord's sacrificial love for the church. Paul teaches men to have the right attitude of humility, appreciation, and love for their wives. <clears throat> true. Yes, true. Yes. Number four, true, Paul did compare the wife's submission with the church's submission and the husband's love with Christ's love. By the way, Paul was single, wasn't he? he well, had been he married was married at one, at one point, time. Huh? At least everybody who belonged to the Sanhedrin was supposed to be married. Yeah. So but He's giving all these discourses on, you know. But Paul does not make this comparison loosely, mixing up theological concepts, thereby providing ground for hierarchical relationships between men and women or for a sacramental view on marriage. On the contrary, the apostle immediately qualifies his com comparison 
and explains very carefully what he means exactly and what the points of comparison are. That comparison refers to the attitudes and forms of submitting to one another and of expressing love from the teacher's Bible study guide. Okay, now we're going to pick a couple of examples to think of from history. Another early Christian apologist by the name of John Chrysostom lived from A.D. 347 to 407, so that's a long time ago. He is known as the famous preacher and the patriarch of the church in Constantinople, which today is called Istanbul. He gave us these interesting words about husbands and wives. This is a good one for you, Myra. <laughs> if I can read the language. Uh, Wouldst thou have thy wife obedient, obedient unto thee, as the church is to Christ? Take then thyself the same provident care for her as Christ takes <coughs> for his church. Yea, even if it shall be needful for thee to give thy life for her, yea, and be cut into pieces ten thousand times, yea, to endure and undergo any suffering whatsoever, refuse it not. Though thou shouldst, shouldst undergo all this, yet wilt thou not, no, not even then, have done anything like Christ. For, though, for thou indeed art doing it for one to whom thou art already knit. You're already married oh. to them. Yes. This is... You want me to try to go yes. ahead? I, I'm afraid I'm slaughtering it because I think it's very nicely you're, you're, done. It's just... You're doing a good job, but I'll go ahead. But he for one who turned... Her, now this is talk Christ by, by contrast. For one the church, that's us, turned her back on him and hated him in the same way then as he laid it at his feet her who turned her back on him, who hated and spurned and disdained him, not by menaces, not by, nor by violence, nor by terror. So he didn't respond in any of those ways, uh, nor by anything else of the kind, but by his unwearied affection. So also do thou behave, behave thyself toward thy wife. For what sort of union is that where the wife trembles at her husband? And what sort of pleasure will the husband himself enjoy if he dwells with his wife as with a slave and not as with a free woman? Yet though thou shouldest suffer anything on her account, do not upbraid her, for neither do Christ do this. And then there's a long... Mm. I'm not going to bother to read all that where it came from. It was quoted in our Bible study guide. Well, not every Bible scholar <laughs> down through history had this same view, great view. The role and status of women through much of history has been bleak. Even the days of the Protestant Reformation, the role of women was very low. Look at this note found in the 1549 reprinting of the Matthews Bible done by Edmund Beck. After reading Peter's counsel that women be in subjection to your own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, that's 1 Peter 3, 1 and 6, Mr. Beck, now this is not from the Bible, understand, the note on the side, attach this note in the margin to male readers. Now, you want some real fun reading, try this. Yeah. Yeah. He dwelleth with his wife according to knowledge that taketh her as a necessary helper, and not a bond servant or a bond slave. And if she be not obedient and helpful unto him, endeavors to beat the fear of God into her head, that, <laughs> I'm sorry, that thereby she may be compelled to learn her duty and do it. As copied as close to original printing as spelling as possible. If you saw the original, it would be even worse. <laughs> Contrast those words from the time of the Protestant Reformation with the following. We have, I think, just about enough time. The view of the Seventh-day Adventists on the family, especially focusing on the relationship between the spouses, is expressed in funda fundamental belief number 23. Marriage was divinely established in Eden and after affirmed by Jesus to be a lifelong union between a man and a woman and loving companionship. For the Christian, a marriage commitment is to God as well as to the spouse and should be entered in, into only between a man and a woman who share a common faith. Mutual love, honor, respect, and responsibilities are the fabric of this relationship, which is to reflect the love, sanctity, chosenness, and permanence of the relationship between Christ and his church. 
Although some family relationship may fall short of the ideal, some human relationships may fall short of the ideal, a man and a woman who fully commit themselves to each other in Christ through marriage may achieve loving unity through the guidance of the Spirit and the nurture of the Church. God blesses the family and intends that its members shall assist each other toward complete maturity. And I, before I read on, I'm going to stop for a second and say, I think my personal, this is my personal opinion, you may not agree with me, but my personal opinion is one of the reasons God asks us to marry someone from the opposite sex is because we need to learn how to get, get along with somebody who doesn't agree with us. Because when we go to heaven, we're going to not only live with somebody who doesn't agree with us, we're going to be living with people from all over the world, from all kinds of cultures, who lived at all different time periods. And we're supposed to get together, with, we're supposed to get along with all of them in a loving manner. That's so it's going to take a thousand years to get people straightened out. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's what well, the millennium. Well, long enough. <laughs> Increasing family closeness is one of the earmarks of the final gospel message. That's from our guidelines from the Adventist Church. And if you get our handout, you can see the, the URL there. Could you, here's our final challenge. Could you present a clear understanding of the ideal Christian relationship in marriage based partly on Ephesians and Colossians? In your culture, wherever you come from, which may be very different from other cultures in the world, how do you see the marriage relationship being practiced? Had, has Christianity had a major impact on how marriages are practiced in your culture? I'll leave that with you. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a challenge is laid out before us here in this ex expounding of the messages of Ephesians 5 and 6. Help us to understand how we can have better relationships, not only with our spouses, but others in the church as a result, as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.